Welcome to the Fangled Cast, brought to you by Fangled Technologies, where we help you convert every person your company touches into a voracious advocate for your brand. Welcome back to the Fangled Cast. Today should be really interesting. I've got two great friends of mine, Khan Apostolopoulos and Elia Gregorius. Two, two guys who wrote a really, really interesting book that I'm going to give them a moment to tell you about, and a little bit about who they are and their history before we kind of dig into the topic of the day. Maybe we'll start with Elia. Thank you, Andrew. It's good to be on your show. Um, yes, Khan and I uh, wrote a book during the pandemic on the early uh, stages of the pandemic called Seven Keys to Navigating a Crisis, a practical guide to emotional dealing with pandemics and other disasters. And it's been very, very interesting. Initially, we wrote it to help individuals. We could feel that there is a tsunami of, uh, you know, stress, mental health, especially coming as a result of the pandemic. Little did we imagine that uh, as the economy began to open up again, that organizations and companies would reach out to us and basically say, our employees are coming back. We don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. They're scared, they're traumatized. Please help us. So, uh, and ever since then, it's been a, a wild ride. Uh, it's, I believe the book is resonating with people because it, it has a, practicality to it. This is not a theoretical book. It wasn't written, you know, from the degrees on the wall. It was written from our hearts, from both of us. And uh, if you pick it up, you open up any page, you will get something out of that will help you to uh, hopefully not just survive uh, the multiplicity of crisis we're facing, but hopefully even thrive. And Coach Khan, you can take it from there. Yeah. And it's, we bring our unique perspectives to the, to the, to the book, Andrew, and to the message that we're sharing. And more than anything, it's a message of hope, it's a message of resilience. And since resilience is a very um, popular word right now, under the, because of the crises and everything sure, else, sure. many people talk about resilience, but very few understand how to get to that point. Uh, what we found is the seven keys to navigating a crisis allows for people to really explore the concept of resilience through those seven keys and be able to reach that point, um, focusing on themselves, but also on the broader aspect of the community and others that might need their help and taking a journey with us throughout that process. Dr. Elia brings his unique perspective um, from his positive psychology background and approaching it from a psychological standpoint. He also has many experiences dealing with crises and being in the front lines, being a first responder to mental health crises in the past. From my perspective, I've dealt with large scale change efforts in corporations. Many of them have been <laughs> driven by the leaders themselves but many of them have not. Many of them have been response to situations that have occurred. And in that way, there are many similarities. So combining those unique perspectives, we've been able to offer something both for the individual on a personal level, but also for the individual as a leader and somebody who has responsibility for others. It's interesting because one of the reasons that I, I find your guys' work so compelling is that exact mix. I, I come from a background similar to Ilya where, with you know, advanced psycho psychology degrees and work, worked as a therapist for a period of time myself. And then combining that with what, you, what your history is with coaching and working in the HR field really gives that, that balance of practicality that, that matters. You know, the, the reason for, for today and, and sort of our topic kind of stems from something that, that I've been observing and discussing in great detail within my network and, and otherwise and possibly we'll, we'll do more in-depth research. But there, there's a, a, a phenomenon that's, that's sort of come into the U.S., and I've noticed it in, in many of my, my overseas clients also, where new people who come to work for companies lead with their confidence without really being aware of whether or not they're competent and what their competence or what their confidence about, excuse me. So, you know, one, one of the, the aspects when, when, the whole sort of controversy long before virus and otherwise, which really isn't what, what we're talking about today, I started to hear this uproar when the millennials came into the workforce. Oh, we can't hire these kids because they, they come out of school and they already think they know everything. They're on the job for, for two days and they want to know why they're not been promoted yet. And, and it, when you really dig into it, and I don't know if it's the era of the participation trophy or, or what it was, but there, there is this new mindset that if I'm confident and I state what I state with confidence, people will believe me, even if I'm incompetent or I don't have the training 
And the funny thing is, it seems to work in the workplace. Um, and I'm, I'm curious in, in terms of your observations and your work, uh, if you've noticed similar trends. Well, from my perspective, and since I'm involved a lot with, um, not just from the executive coaching level, but actually doing workshops for even young leaders, emerging leaders, and even in the world of sports, working with young people that are coming through and teaching life skills and leadership skills through youth soccer and other sporting pieces. Um, one of the things that I notice about this, this this generation is, you're right, they are full of confidence. Much of that comes from um, the fact that it's been instilled at home. Mm -hmm. This generation has received much support from their family structure as a general rule. <clears throat> there are always exceptions, but as a general rule, they've been very supported and cared for, which allows them to spring from a point of confidence that they can do anything. When your parents tell you your entire life, your young life, that you know what, you're special, you're outstanding, you can do anything you set your mind to, at some point you start believing that and you come forward with that. But it's also important to understand that part of the development of an adult mind, and especially in the professional environment, there are four different stages that go through that. I mean, you start with unconscious incompetence, as we call it. In many ways, you don't know what you don't know. And part of that evolution in the model that that I know that we're gonna be talking about is that aspect of, at some point, I get slapped about the head and realize, you know what, hey, maybe I don't know some things. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then it becomes conscious incompetence. And ultimately, through the development, through the experiences that we go through, it becomes conscious competence. Now I know what I know. And then ultimately it becomes second nature when you reach that point of mastery where it becomes again unconscious competence. And now all of a sudden we've completed that cycle. Think about anybody that's learned how to drive a stick shift. When you were first starting that out, you thought you could just get behind the wheel and just drive. Well, that's not the case. Imagine all of the hardship and the frustration that went through stopping and starting, trying to get Absolutely. to that balance. Now, when you step behind the wheel, you don't think about it twice. Yeah, it's that, that was how I learned to drive. Yeah. And and I remember when I was in college, a couple of buddies wanted to go to Florida for spring break and my car was a stick and it's yeah. a, it was a 16 hour drive. So they were, well, we don't know how to drive your car. And <laughs> and it, it, it's interesting because to me it was second nature. And I remember going through what I went through, kind of, but it had been so long ago, just several years that that I'm now trying to teach what was initially difficult, but 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 now I knew and ended up driving 16 hours to Florida because right. they they just wouldn't they just couldn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. They were there was it almost did. it was almost too embarrassing for them to keep trying mm. because it just wasn't it wasn't something that I don't know it was an, it was an interesting experience. That's a great analogy. I always use the the one about the skier. Right. You know, I live I live in Ohio and here a ski hill in Ohio is a lump compared to where where you guys <laughs> where you guys live in Colorado. So what happens is, you know, a kid in high school gets in the ski club and every Saturday they go to the ski hill and they learn and they, it's a five minute run from top to bottom. If you're lucky, it takes that long. And they leave here going, oh, my God, I am a brilliant skier. Then they go on their first vacation to Park City or they go to Whistler and they get dropped off at the very top of that hill and they can't see the bottom. And they finally realize it's all that stuff I didn't know that I didn't know about skiing. It, it breaks that bubble into that second phase that you were just talking about. But if you asked your buddies before the trip if they could drive the car, if they could help you drive there, I'm sure they would have said, oh, of course I can. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And it's and, and it leads in. Uh, Ilya, you were about to say something. I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you, what you guys have presented just now is an overinflated sense of the ego. Absolutely. Like, it, until reality hits. I do see that with people coming into the workforce, basically, with that false sense of uh, confidence. And the attitude is, this company is lucky to have me. Yes. Versus saying, I am lucky to be <laughs> hired by this company, you know, and I'm here to learn. So uh, they have it a little bit backwards. And I, I think in the in the history of, uh, you know, Greek philosophers going way, way back 2,500 years ago, the greatest philosopher of them all, you know, Socrates, Plato's mentor in essence, right? When he was asked, Master, tell us something that you know definitively, he says, the only thing I know is how much I don't know. And that, and that stunned his disciples, basically. They were like, what? But think about how profound that is. The older we get, the more experience we have, the more education, and I'm talking about life education now, the more we recognize how little we really do know. 
And that's the right attitude. Unfortunately, we live in a society where uh, if you have a few thousand followers, somehow you're an influencer and uh, you know, you're know you a master at what you espouse. But the reality is, if you look underneath all that stuff, that's almost like a bubble that's about to burst because it doesn't have substance. Mm -hmm. True leaders have substance. Yeah. True leaders have humility. Absolutely. True leaders know what they don't know. And like Steve Jobs once said, I hire smart people to tell me what to do, not for me to tell them what to do. And that's the, you know, I mean, that's the perfect leadership approach, right? I love that quote by Steve Jobs. It's brilliant. You know, it's, it's funny because the best leaders are the ones that have had those humbling moments where the bubble gets burst. It's, I, I would imagine that the kid who I used in the analogy of skiing who gets to the top of the hill and doesn't have that moment of this is different, holy cow, I didn't know all these things I didn't know, is probably the one the ski patrol's picking up in about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Whereas the one who recognizes it takes a very cautious, intelligent, humble first run down that hill. Uh, you know, we, we one of the things we had talked about prior to this was the, the most talked about uh, phenomenon, and you, people refer to it all the time, don't really understand, which is the, the research that led to what they call the Dunning-Kruger effect, which in, the crass people will say, ah, it's how stupid people think they're smart. That's not what it is. That's just rude. What it really is, is what we're talking about is how is it that people who underperform and somehow still have this confidence that they're the best at it? There's uh, some of the research that was done, and I, I think you guys are familiar with it, where they gave a, a test to a big group of people, and then before they graded the test, asked them how they did. And when you looked at the results, the guys who, who did the best assumed that everybody did well because it was, it was so easy. So they thought that they did average, and the people who were at the bottom that did the worst on the test were the ones that had the confidence they had done the best. Um, and, and I always want to relate these things back to the workforce because that's what the podcast is about. So when you bring in a, a group of recruits into a, a, a new company, we've just hired a team of, I don't know, customer service people, who all think that they're really high performers when in fact they're not there yet. What are some techniques that the companies can use to burst that bubble to help them to, to recognize and become high performers rather than getting frustrated leaving and having to be replaced and the cost of doing that? Well, from my perspective, it starts with the selection piece. Uh, when I work with, with hiring managers, interviewers, recruiters, uh, to really distinguish who's the right fit for our company, um, many times I, I, I help them understand the power of behavioral based interviewing, the power of looking for examples to really put things in context, both for the for the candidate, but also for the company. It's very easy for me to interview somebody who claims to be the top salesperson in their company, only to find out when I dig a little bit deeper that they were the only salesperson in their company. Mm -hmm. So you can you can see that as somebody misrepresenting themselves or you can see that as somebody who really doesn't get it and understand the scope of what it takes to be part of a broader sales team. You ask people, OK, your title here says manager. OK, what will you manager of? Because I can compare managers, but I know managers that are potentially overseeing maybe themselves and maybe an administrative assistant mm -hmm. overseeing a function or a manager that's responsible for 500 people in an operation. These are very different things. So getting the context of the person's experience is key to really being able to distinguish what this experience means, to translate that. Titles are you know, the starting point. When you put a label on something, that's a starting point, but being able to explore that further. Now, once you have that person inside the company, now it's a matter of, can you put them in situations where they can safely understand what their growth path needs to be where they are to really gauge when things are. We need to use a proverbial yardstick to really help them understand mm -hmm. when, how, their, how their knowledge, their experience translates. Even simulations, for example, in selection. These are key pieces to really understand what people can truly do. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Doctor, do you have other things that you've experienced? Well, I would say we have to be, sometimes you're dealing with very fragile egos, actually. You know, they come out of college maybe, and they think that they, uh, they're they king of the world and so on, and then reality hits. So I think we have to also manage that and coach and mentor and share with them that, hey, listen, it's okay if you don't know. 
you know, the imposter syndrome. I remember when I got my PhD in psychology and I started w working with clients and uh, I, I looked like I was 20 years old and people would like look at me. I'm like, seriously, you're the therapist. <laughs> you know, and I almost felt like an imposter. Like on the inside, I'm like, what do I know? I mean, I remember giving marriage advice to somebody who had been married for 30 years and I myself was 29 years old. <laughs> so, you, you know, so I there was a lot of, I don't know, about forced humility. It's like, man, you don't know anything about life really so listen and learn i feel like i learned most the most things that i've learned was not from my degrees but was actually from my patients mm -hmm. from my clients yeah. they taught me more than anything that else i could have learned in in academia and and that's where you pay your dues in essence when you do you know your clinical hours when you're working at a counseling center and you're seeing people that are just coming off the street and it's hard but it was the best training ever real life real people um and and just being open to knowing what you don't know and of course having a great supervisor and having truly a great mentor that guided me and supported me i'm indebted to him forever um and 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 he taught me something you know his, his name was dr olson he was on my dissertation committee but also my supervisor he used to go almost like every month he would go to some kind of seminar some kind of conference some kind of and he had more letters after his name already like than anybody else I knew. And one time and he would on Monday, he would come back and tell us what he attended. Right. And I said, Dr. Olson, you know, you're so knowledgeable. You have all these degrees. You have all this stuff. What do you go to these conferences for? Like, seriously, he goes, listen, if I can take one thing out of an eight hour conference or a two day conference that I can apply in my own life and in the life of my students like yourself, then that conference has been a success. I don't need to learn eight hours or 16 hours worth of stuff to make it a success. One thing that I can apply. And 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 he would teach that to us, right? And so I realized we never stop learning. That was the message that I got from him. I don't care how accomplished you are, how educated you are, how many letters you have after your name, continue to learn throughout your lifetime. And that was the message that was very powerful for a young mind like me. I looked at him, I'm like, I want to be like that. I never want to stop learning. That's 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 really inspirational in a lot of ways, you know. When in in, in the, from the consulting side, where we're meeting with clients, not employees, but people looking for help, one of the things that we offer at Fangled is, is what we call the pick my brain session, where we'll actually give somebody, no 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 ties to it, thirty minutes of our time, to flesh out an idea, to to discuss something in the, in the marketing realm, and we don't charge for it. Uh, and many of these sessions end up being how do you burst that bubble. Because people will come with an idea that they absolutely know is perfect, but there's massive flaws because of all the stuff they don't know that they don't know. And a great example, which actually wasn't one of those sessions, I gave a lecture uh, at Cleveland State a few years back about global trade. And after the class, these are these are master's level in international trade students, and a kid uh, who was he'd gone from high school to college, now he's in grad school in the U.S. He was from Pakistan. <laughs> And he wanted to talk to me about his business idea. I said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell, I'm going to import hair gel from Pakistan to the U.S. And I need your help. And I said, well, why would you import? And now he's, in his mind, it's a great product. What, what is it about this hair gel that you think there's market for? And his entire business model, as a grad student ready to graduate, was what? It was, people tell me my hair looks good when I use it. That was his entire... And I know it's, it's a little extreme, but that's exactly what it was. So I started to ask, well, do you know if the ingredients in the product exist in the U.S., in, in, in a product that's already on the market? Have you done any testing to see if people really did think it was your hair gel or just that you're handsome? Is there restrictions to import? Are there biases in the American market against uh, healthcare products that come from that part of the world? And I started asking all of these questions. And by the time it was over, the bubble was burst. And he said... Well, I'm so glad I asked you because I had no idea all of those things that I should have been thinking about. I'm going to rethink and, and go back to it. So in, in, for, for, for me, with somebody who's not a client or somebody who, who isn't an employee, it really the technique we use to burst the bubble when we have to with, with someone is to ask all of the unknowns to such a degree that they recognize... <laughs> Oh my God! There, there's a whole world out there I wasn't aware of, and I'm wondering, in you know, in, in new employees at, at a lower level in a company, 
how do you do that in a way that inspires and 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 gets them excited about it rather than scaring them away? To answer that question, I think the easiest way to put it is put them in the circumstances, put them in, in an environment where they can see that for themselves. Um, again, you, you want to minimize the risk factor in this case. You obviously mm -hmm. don't want to embarrass them. You don't want to put them in a situation. That's so you're right. not going to ask them to lead a team under those circumstances. But you are going to start bring, bring them along by adding them to a team, uh, mm -hmm. mentoring them, uh, by partnering them up with somebody with more experience that they can shadow and help and understand um, and really set clear expectations about what it is. When somebody is that enthusiastic and coming along, uh, if we use a known situational leadership model, for example, when you look about that, the balance that you have as a leader, that you need to pull those two levers, the leader of clear direction and clear support. When somebody's coming in and they're that enthusiastic, which I love, by the way, I don't see mm -hmm. that as an impediment. It's only an impediment if they're not willing to learn. But right. to me, I love the enthusiasm. And to me, what's missing from that is the structure, the understanding of how to safely allow them to learn that, you know, the pond is a lot bigger than you think. You are in one little corner, so you may have been a big fish in that small pond or that small corner of the pond, but let me show you the rest of the pond. So now you bring them along and you allow them to swim, not with the sharks, but you put them in a situation where now they can start growing and they can start expanding and they can start reaching that conscious incompetence and conscious competence down the road so they can continue to their, their development. But it happens with all of us, Andrew. I mean, let's face it. How many of us are in mid-career level and yet we go into a situation, I've been doing this job for 20 years. I could do that with my eyes. Closed. I see that all the time with frontline people that have been workers many times, very capable workers, mm -hmm. but they get promoted and they don't realize that that's a whole different dynamic. I had a class yesterday with emerging leaders where the conversation was stop being a super doer and start being a supervisor and yeah. start leading the team differently like that. and start being in a situation now where what got you to the dance is the first thing mm -hmm. you're going to have to let go of. You cannot be the top performer on your team. Same thing with these young people. They're coming in. Part of me, and I will defend them for a second because you know, I have a daughter that's in that in that age bracket coming in. And one of the things that I realize observing her is that part of their cockiness, part of their confidence comes from the simple fact that they may not know what it is or what they need to do. But you know what? They can find it within five minutes. Yep. Seconds. <laughs> and, th and that's the thing. Right now, this generation and the way that, for example, learning and development has evolved it's no longer about giving you this huge binder like the ones I carry behind me. It's not about that anymore. It's about, can I show you where to find the information, mm -hmm. the most relevant information and the most fresh information? Yep. That's the difference. Yep. And, but even, even with that, and again, bursting that bubble, when, when, when you hear that, I can find it in five seconds, five minutes on the phone, is when you get it, do you know what to do with it? Correct. Yep. That's where we need to help them. Yep. That's where they need the help. Yeah, I mean, from a practical standpoint, there's there's two parts of it. There's there's what's ethical and moral, and then there's the cost. Hiring people is expensive, and not when you when you do hire, you've done your evaluation, you brought in these people. If you don't invest the cost and the time to to then help them to be successful, it's a waste of money, and it's it's to me it's it's a moral issue. It's there there are companies that I've I've worked with and I've been aware of where they'll hire a hundred salespeople out of college knowing only 10 of them will survive. To me, that's an immoral hiring practice. It's, it's you know, let, let's, let's weed them out and the ones that's the left standing, sort of the reality television show version of, of, of the employment process. Where, whereas if you've got somebody on your staff who's brilliant and really does a great job and could move up, before you move them up, do you provide them with the resources to, to, to earn leadership? For example, in the sales team, your highest hunter professional sales guy will be a horrible sales manager because they don't, what got them there won't get them to the next level. As a matter of fact, my favorite book to recommend to people is What Got You Here Won't Get You There. I think it was Goldman is the author. Is that you don't have those tools. So if, you've, if, if you truly respect the people in your business and, and you lead with kindness, you provide that training in the early stages of their career so that when they finally do achieve the level, they're ready. What happens most of the time is, uh, so and so quit. We got to promote Bob. 
uh, let's hope he can get trained quick enough to be able to be, you know. So I, I like, I really like what you've got to say about that. That's that's really helpful. When a, when a company uh, brings me in to help them, sometimes even find the hidden talent that people that are maybe farther down the organizational chart. I have a, a, a tree of assessments called Tal Insight, basically mm -hmm. insight into talent that looks at your behavioral style, your thinking style, and your motivational style. And the report that those individuals get is so uh, accurate and, and, and so deep that they're able to look at their strengths, but they're also able to look at their potential limitation, uh, limitations, plural. And it's done in a way that it doesn't put you on the defensive. Like when you look at your potential limitations, it makes it very easy for you to go, yeah, that's totally me. You know, especially under stress where your your strengths, if you add stress into it, could become your potential limitations if you over rely on your strengths. So that gives people uh, information enough to say, I'm really good at this. This is the reason why I think the way that I do. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a practical thinker or I'm an unconventional <laughs> thinker, like somebody who thinks outside of the box, like a Steve Jobs, for example, or an Elon Musk. And they also have you know tremendous, brilliant minds, tremendous strengths, but they also have, you know, some of their limitations, which is uh, they're like, they lack patience because mm -hmm. they get to the solution thinking differently than the rest of us who are conventional thinkers. And then they don't have the patience to wait for the rest of the team to get to the answer. Like what is wrong with these knuckleheads basically, yeah. right? <laughs> you know, and I have to teach them like, you gotta be patient, your mind thinks differently. But if you're part of this team, you have to wait for them to catch up to you. It yeah. doesn't mean that they're incompetent. They just think differently than you. And they're like, man, my whole life, I, <clears throat> I felt like I didn't fit in, like I was different than anybody else. Now that you've explained this and you explained to me, why do I think that the way that I do mm -hmm. or why do I behave this certain way? That kind of information and insight allows people to, to grow and yes, to maximize their strengths, but to also to be on the lookout for their potential limitations, because yeah. those are the ones that usually when we get hijacked at a meeting, oftentimes, and I'm talking about emotional hijacking now. Yeah, that sometimes causes us to have like disciplinary issues or even getting fired is because we didn't know our blind spots. Yep. Well, you to to be aware that you even have blind spots is a huge step towards leadership and towards being successful. Yeah. In my own personal development, that seeking my own blind spots is so important for me. Um, I, I, an example, somebody I meet someone the first time and I go, God, that guy's brilliant. Or I meet someone and go, boy, that guy. He kind of sucks. I immediately have to check with myself. Is that correct? Or do I have some sort of internal bias that I'm now looking at somebody who I thought was brilliant is probably going to take me down the wrong road or that guy sucks. And it turns out that it's just a, you know, something about me. And, and the reality is he could really help and grow the business. And, and then many times it turns out, you know, well, you were right. The guy is genius or the guy does suck. But most of the time it's, it, it's something internal that caused me to feel that way. But most people don't do what you do, Andrew. Most people don't take that second step. They go with their first instinct and they and they believe that as if it's the word of God, basically, and they don't reflect like they should. Wait a minute, is there something that I'm bringing into this? Maybe this person reminds you of someone that I disliked and therefore automatically mm -hmm. they're an idiot. Versus, or, or vice versa, they remind me of something that I liked a lot and they're brilliant all of a sudden, so. And, and a lot of the times what we react to is a unique ability of that person that that we have an issue to be uncomfortable with. I think it was on 60 Minutes, they were interviewing uh, people who were hiring folks with autism and how people with autism in an interview have, have a demeanor that makes people uncomfortable so they don't get hired. But when people understand the hidden talents that many autistic people have on their team, they get 10 times the bang for their buck when they do hire them and, and create for example, quiet spaces and, and things that, that for them to excel. And, and again, it's, you know, do, do, do we burst our own bubble on a regular basis to realize what we don't know that we don't know, or do we continue just thinking we're geniuses and moving forward and, and missing out on just great opportunities in our lives? Uh, Andrew, in, in with my organization with Fresh Biz Solutions, part of our mantra has always been hire hard, train smart, manage easy. I love that. And, and a big part of that in that simple message is if we're going to be picky, we need to be picky about who we add to our team and make sure that we we check all of the areas that were important to us. For example, not missing out on talent just because they're different from a certain pace, making sure that the systems that we design to make the selection are are 
as bias free as we can make them. And partially because we incorporate, we teach organizations to, to get multiple perspectives on something. Or if you're interviewing a particular kind of candidate or for a particular kind of position, really bringing in more knowledge about how to really look for those key indicators, those key markers that we're looking for. And then using the, tr the smart aspect of on-the-job training or different pieces that we talked about through mentorship programs or formal training to really get them there. That allows us now to get to what Dr. Ilya ultimately said, the Steve Jobs quote, where you now allow to, to unleash that potential of your people to really move the organization forward and allow that talent to happen. But so many companies really don't do the work before it becomes urgent, before that opening happens that we didn't expect. And now we're rushing. Oh, who are we going to put in there? Let's put Bob. I had beers with Bob last week and he seems like a nice guy. And all of a sudden, you know what? We miss out on all this talent. Well, part of the structure is part of the pieces that need to be put in place is do you have a clear understanding of your talent? Have you segmented your talent to know who's got the performance, the potential and the desire, all three parts of that to really be in a position to move up? And have we identified them and how ready they are to move into that next level? That's it's so interesting. You know, I, I, I love this discussion. I wish we could go on and on, but we're we're pushing on the time envelope here. I always try to end with two things. The first is, I'll start with Ilya. Is there anything that I didn't ask that I should have that would enhance this this conversation? Not, not that I can think of, but there is something that you both spoke about that has to do with the enthusiasm a new employee has. You don't want to snuff that because I think that kind of enthusiasm and that kind of energy that they bring into, it's almost like a puppy, right? That you still have to train the puppy but you don't want to snuff that and and because that to me that energy is what propels them to success if it's guided properly mm -hmm. by the right mentorship and the right coaching so i just want to make sure that that energy is maintained for a new employee along with that kind of mentorship that uh, would make them successful because to me energy is everything right whether it's positive or negative energy it can make or break your team or your yep. company so that's really that's really really inter an interesting way of putting it thank you how about you, Khan? What didn't I ask you? I should have asked you. I think our conversation went and covered a very, very broad scope of kind of the area that we're looking at. But to me, ultimately, is if companies really feel that their people are their greatest asset, they need to really start acting in the way that is consistent with that. Right now, in the middle of where we are with the compounding crises, I think there is a huge opportunity for a smart company, for a smart leader, to find a lot of that talent that's been released into the workforce because companies panicked and really to be able to top grade your, your, your team, to find that, that talent out there that's now all of a sudden without a job and really bring, being able to bring them, to add them to your team. They will both be grateful and I think they'll be excited to really join your team and I think they could make a big difference. But that comes from really understanding where am I at with my own talent? It's really great. It's almost like in baseball, like all the all the players became free agents, you know, and uh, where companies are retracting. This is the time to actually go out there and and sign up the best players available. I think that's what Coach Khan is saying. Yep. Yeah, I think that's great. But we're gonna gonna wrap it up for for folks watching. Thanks so much for. I hope I hope this material was was helpful. Uh, there'll be notes in in as it's posted on ways to find these these two. Great, great guys. I think that if if you've got issues or you just want to enhance and, and make your workspace better for your employees and truly prove that you have the respect for people and value the folks, these are great guys to be talking to. Uh, all of that will be so you can do the whole share like the, the cliche that ends most podcasts. And uh, thanks so much for being on, guys. I really appreciate you being here today and, and look forward to continuing our, our, our great relationship. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Brought to you by Bangle Technologies, where we help you convert every person your company touches into a voracious advocate for your brand.